This is Dennis McMahon and welcome to Positively Vermont. And today we will be speaking with uh, Meredith Angwin, uh, who is the author of a wonderful book called Shorting the Grid, uh, The Hidden Fragility of Our Electric Grid. And uh, she is a uh, resident of Vermont and uh, she's been very active in the this field, uh, and she has produced, uh, in my opinion, a very readable work and a very important work, uh, but we'll let her explain that for us. So welcome, Meredith. I'm very happy to be here, Dennis. Thank you for inviting me. And could you tell us a, a little or a lot about yourself so our, our viewers can uh, get to know you before we talk about the subject? Well, I always wanted to be a, a scientist and I came up with the idea that being a chemist would be the best kind because chemists can always make some progress. What I'm saying is I knew some physicists, but they were all, always after the theory of everything. Well, chemists keep improving things. So I became a chemist and uh, after a while I became uh, interested in, in, in power plants. This sort of partially happened because I was working on pollution control from nitrogen oxides. And I was also very interested in geothermal energy. In the long run, I ended up at the Electric Power Research Institute in the renewables group. And then I switched to the nuclear group as I began to see the promise of nuclear. So I did this switch when nobody was doing this switch. I mean, back when people were like, uh, you know, oh my gosh, you know, nuclear is so bad. At any rate, uh, I, I have patents. I worked as a chemist. I worked as a project manager. Uh, I was one of the few women at that level uh, back in the day. Luckily, there's tons and tons of women now. I'm so happy to see that. I mean, you can't, I mean, I was one of four girls in the physics class of 70 at one point. I mean, I, that isn't what it is today. And I can, can, cannot, can only say how happy I am to see that because after all, I have uh, granddaughters as well as grandsons. So at any rate, um, uh, moving moving along with that, I uh, when I came here and I sort of semi retired, I uh, I always I began writing more. Um, I'd always enjoyed writing, but you know, in a full time job, not so easy. So uh, at any rate, um, I also wanted to get involved in what's going on in in the energy area around here because you know I always remember that I was one of the few women in the Electric Power Research Institute when I joined it. And, uh, and uh, so at any rate, um, I began writing a blog and uh, the blog, somebody at the blog read the blog and noticed that I was writing about the grid. And he suggested that I join the consumer liaison group of uh, our grid operator. Uh, and I did, and then I got elected to the steering committee of that group. And I began finding out a lot about the grid. And I mean, it was like this whole new world. I didn't understand any of it when I started. And um, I'm, I'm going to say that in, in, uh, in many cases, one of the reviews of my book on Amazon said, the complexity is a feature, not a bug. It's a feature because it hides what's going on. The people who are involved in this are delighted with it. I'm like, oh. That might explain why I didn't get it until I had been in this consumer liaison group for a couple of years. So at any rate, so I began thinking that people, that I didn't like the idea that the complexity was hiding things, that people could make assertions that were not backed in fact, because uh, if you looked at it a certain way, you could say maybe it looked that way. So anyway, I ended up writing this book because I, I wanted people to know what's going on with the grid and maybe begin to take some action about it. So I guess that's the, the end of the story there. That's great. And, I, and you live in Vermont, and I understand your husband, George, uh, who we want yes. to give credit to. Uh, was, uh, oh, he, he's, he is amazing. I mean, we met in physics class, and he's the most amazing person. He's, he's, uh, 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 he, he, his degree is in mathematics, mine is in chemistry, and he is so... Oh, 
he actually worked in software most of his life, which is what most people who get degrees in mathematics do. But he he is so organized and he was so helpful to me with this book. I mean, it couldn't have, I mean, this book has a 12 page glossary and three about 300 uh, footnotes and notes. I mean, without his help, it, it wouldn't be the book. I mean, he is just the kind of person that I, I, I need in my life. Luckily, I've been married to him for over 50 years, so I, I have him in my life. That's wonderful. And I, I want to tell you that uh, it really grabbed me from page one. And I just want to, uh, there's a lot of quotable quotes here. We're not going to have time to go through all the notes that I've made. But what really was shocking, and of course, I apologize for any of the puns that refer to electricity. What was kind of shocking was <laughs> on page one, you, you compare this to the financial crisis of 2007. Uh, and, and the impact of that. Can you just give us a little teaser on, on that? Well, I, the, the financial crisis of 2007, one of the hallmarks of it was that everything was very built up and, and confusing. And so you really couldn't see what was going on. I mean, if you had simply said, oh, they're making a lot of loans to, um, to uh, people who really can't pay them back, that's something you could say, oh, that, that's not good. But what they had was collateralized debt obligations and credit default swaps and layers and layers and layers of acronyms so that a person uh, walking around uh, who was used to the idea that they, you know, you get, you, you apply for a mortgage and you show your background and you get a mortgage and then you buy your house. Uh, they would not have any idea what was going on. And, and I, I felt that in the book, um, uh, The Big Short, was really about a bunch of people who had figured out what was going on through the um, through studying what what all these different things were and who who was putting them out and what kind of backup they had, and I thought you know the, the grid is like that too. Nobody nobody knows. Everybody just goes around. You know. Oh yeah, it's fine uh, because they have built up many many layers of of confusion, in my opinion. Well, let's, let's begin at the beginning. What is the grid? Uh, well, the, song, uh, the, the name of a uh, science fiction movie, but what is the, the grid? The grid that I'm talking about is the electric grid. And it, it, it consists of generators of various kinds, which could include photovoltaics or whatever that put uh, electricity on the grid. Then it has substations. Then it has, you know, um, and it has a, a, a balancing authority. You say, well, I never heard of that one. The, the, and of course it has wires connecting things, you know, transmission lines, distribution lines in your own, uh, own area, transformers to take the uh, a high voltage power and put it to a level of power that can be used at your home, all these things. Well, the thing is, what's the balancing authority? I think this is where it starts that people don't know what's going on. The, um, the grid is, the, your electricity has to be in balance when, with the electricity produced at all times instantaneously. So it, when you turn on a light, uh, in general, some power plant picks up its speed a little bit, takes a little more uh, fuel to run it or whatever in order to make up for the light you turned on. Now, it, and when you turn it off, the thing happens in reverse. Now, the, there's a, a, a flow of electricity, uh, a, a curve over the day. At, at four in the morning, uh, there's not much electricity being used compared to four in the afternoon. Uh, and uh, and the person, there's a group, the grid operator is in charge of managing, calling power plants online, telling power plants to go offline in order to keep that balance going. And um, if ISO New England is our grid operator and it has many different roles, but one of the most important roles and a role that's on every grid is balancing authority, running the control room that says, power plant you, go on. Power plant you, uh, I'm sorry, it's, uh, the, the uh, uh, 
demand is dropping, you go offline now. Power plant, you, well, look, we actually need you, but your, your lines over there, they're, they're, getting, they're getting overloaded. So you've got to go offline until one of the other power plants in your area also goes offline. Oh, okay, okay, now you can come back on again. And, 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 and the, that is this huge room in ISO New England with four, I think six operators working all the time, two sitting in, in, in other positions um, for backup to them. Some of the things that are surprising about that room, they've got a big uh, TV screen. And you say, what? What's with the TV screen? Are they bored? No. If something happens, sometimes that is reflected about five seconds later or 10, 10 seconds later by a drop or increase in, in, uh, in, in electricity man. You see? So it, it, it's an amazing place. Oh, they have, I, I want to say that that's not the only one they have. They have an, a backup one in another state and they switch back and forth uh, between the main balancing authority room and the backup uh, at least once a month so they know that it actually works. So what I'm saying is this is an amazing thing, the, the balancing authority. And it's an important thing for every grid where things get, dicey is what are the rules that the balancing authority uses to call this power plant instead of that power plant and that a lot of my book is about those rules let me ask you this this is the, the one word that we're going to be probably appears in this book many 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 times is rto tell us what an rto is and how vermont is involved with that okay unfortunately this has to go with some history in the old days, uh, and, and throughout most of the much of the country now, utilities were vertically integrated. That is, if I'm a utility, I own a power plant, I own, I own, um, I own distribution. I have a group that stands by to deal with billing issues, and uh, and I have some share, some payment to transmission that goes between states. And what I do is control, I have to ask my local state uh, public utilities commission or public service board for permission if I want to start a power plant. Uh, I mean, if I I want to build a power plant, retire a power plant, um, build a transmission line, buy a part of a different transmission line. Well, it turned out that the, 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 uh, during the time when everything was being deregulated, there was an idea that if we deregulated utilities, that it wouldn't have them go into the PUCs, but rather had regional organizations, everything would be cheaper. And those regional organizations are the regional transmission organizations, and they have a, a lot more power than the local PUCs had. The local PUCs uh, could say, do this or do that. In some ways, the regional transmission organizations don't have much power in the sense that they can't, they can't have a, they can't ask for a new power plant to be built or a new power plant to be delayed. They're supposed to do everything through a series of auctions. People are supposed to, different power plants are supposed to bid in and then they get chosen. And then, um, and, and then, and, and the thing is that it wasn't working. So what they do is they add another auction to make up for the problems of the first auction. Uh, let me give you an example of that. Uh, and I, I feel like we're never, uh, so they have an auction for kilowatt hours. So that you know, people bid in and, and, and they say, I can give you kilowatt hours at this price. And then the least expensive ones are chosen by the balancing authority. Well, this was a bit of a problem because um, there was no promise of uh, payment of any particular amount. It was whatever cleared at the auction. And so if you owned a power plant that was only on part of the time, like it from two to four in the afternoon most days or something, or from four to six on winter evenings, you didn't know if you're going to get paid enough to keep that power plant in good shape. So they ended up with capacity auctions where you bid in and say, I'm going to keep this power plant in good shape and you have to pay me for the fact that I have capacity and reserve for you. Okay, so they begin paying capacity auctions. And that 
got a little bad because you can have a, a gas fire plant and then bid into the capacity auction and it gets its payment. And then on a cold winter night where everybody's using gas for their homes, the, the balancing authority says, you, online. And they say, oh, sorry about that. We can't get any gas right now. So then, of course, they try to solve this with yet another auction called the uh, anyway, so you see, I, I, have I given you a fairly, I hope I've given a, a good overview of what the uh, RTO uh, does. Well, one thing I want to, uh, there's, there's a, a lot to this. And again, I want to stress that it is highly readable, highly exciting in many parts. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very uh, revealing. And, and the other thing I want to say about your book, uh, it's immensely fair. Uh, that you know, you give both sides or all sides of certain issues about uh, fuel preference and policy uh, and, and things like that, and also uh, about fairness. Uh, the, I want to uh, ask you about RTOs operating not like uh, any government agency. The relative secrecy that goes on when power decisions, uh, whether they be split second or whether they be long term policy, are made without the uh, uh, knowledge or a uh, quote interference unquote uh, by the general public, the people who pay for this. Can you tell us a little bit about the lack of transparency in this area? Well, there's two organizations in the RTO. The first one is the ISO New England that runs the balancing authority. And it, ISO it, New England, what does ISO mean? Uh, Independent System Operator New England. Mm -hmm. And they're down in Holyoke, Massachusetts, as well as other locations, which I'm not sure they disclose <laughs> for their backup uh, grid operator thing. And then there's uh, Neepool, a uh, Northeast Power Pool. And Neepool um, was set up about the same time the ICOs, but it's very different. To be in Neepool, you have to be pretty much a participant in the markets. Well, so they have, they have six sectors and sectors include uh, transmission operators, uh, um, uh, traditional power plants, alternative power plants, uh, public power, pu uh, uh, public utilities such as municipal utilities. And one of the six sectors with 16% of the votes is end users. We are the end users are totally outvoted. Plus, the end user sector is not like you would expect it to be AARP and stuff. It's also where the Sierra Club, the Massachusetts Attorney General, uh, and so forth, they are in the end user sector. Now, the thing about the Neepool meetings is you have to be invited. You can't, uh, you can't uh, say what happened at the NICO meeting. Uh, they, they had a big uh, flap when a, uh, a reporter wanted to join. They said, okay, you can, they, they even appealed to FERC to keep the reporter out. This is, I mean, the lack of transparency is almost overwhelming uh, when you begin looking at, uh, the thing about NIPU, by the way, is their group decides who, are the has to vet the uh, the um, board of directors for ISO New England. So you see that ISO New England is is fairly independent. Tries to do the right thing. Tries to get balancing authority working right. Uh, you know all that stuff. But when you get right down to it, Nepool holds the, the 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 big cards. That's my opinion. I mean, somebody else may say something different, but uh, as far as I can tell, NEPA holds the big cards. And let me also say, and I think this is very important, uh, the people involved are very good people. They're very nice people. They're very kind people. Uh, if they can't tell me something, they're happy to say, I'm sorry, I can't say that, as opposed to, you know, who, who the heck are you to ask? And I just want you to know that it's set up for this secrecy it's set up so the different groups that I was naming, like transmission, can go in there and fight for rules that will help their companies. That's why they're sent there. They're paid by companies to go there and help make rules that will help their companies. The trouble is, it's all, uh, it's not something you or I can find out much about. Mm -hmm. And when you mentioned FERC, F-E-R-C, tell us what that is just briefly. 
Okay, FERC is going to be an important agency. It is an important agency. It's the most important agency that nobody's heard about. The federal Energy, uh, uh, oh my gosh, um, Regulatory Commission. And, and it's, um, it's, it's based in Washington. And the way it's set up is that um, it has five commissioners, three are chosen by the president's party, and three are chosen by the opposition party. I'm sorry, two was chosen by the opposition party. And uh, it has to have a quorum of three commissioners before it can make a ruling. And it turns out that everything keeps going back to FERC. So for example, uh, Nepal may say, I want to have these rules put into effect. And ISO may say, ISO New England say, I, I don't like those rules. We're putting in different ones. It'll be more fair to people. And then so what that happens is that NEPOL and ISO New England file their proposed rules to FERC at the same time. This is called a jump ball filing. And I've got several of them described in the book. I mean, in some ways, it's an exciting book to read. Who's going to win the jump ball? Anyway, but, but the thing is, FERC is the one that decides. And, uh, and um, actually, I think FERC is more open. It has more open meetings and stuff than NEPOL does or, or ISO New England does. Uh, ISO New England, uh, uh, well, NEPOL is the one with the, that, that really was very upset about a reporter showing up at their meetings. Well, there's a, 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 there's a great deal of, of the material here. And again, I, I keep saying it's, it's very readable. Uh, and the, also there are some quotable quotes that you have here, uh, which we're not gonna be able to get into because of time, but I'm sure uh, people are gonna, gonna see when they, when they get the book. Uh, but but let's, while we have some time, let's talk about renewables and the role that plays and some of your opinions on what's going on now uh, with that. Uh, in terms of your book and in terms of what you do? Well, let me start out by saying that when I started working in the utility industry, what I really wanted was to be uh, in the renewables group. And I did get into the renewables group at EPRI and I felt really good about that. And then I realized that renewables were, I don't know, they, they, can't, they can't make much power reliably and they're just not a very reliable source I, I i was it was very uh kind of upsetting to me i was i was young i mean it was a lot a long time ago and i was very idealistic and i didn't anyway so i began realizing that nuclear was also good in terms of things that were important to me which is basically air pollution i grew up in chicago a very polluted city and air pollution uh Preventing air pollution has always been very, very uh, important to me. Um, so in terms of, but, we, but you asked about renewables now. What happens now is that um, uh, a state uh, can, can uh, decide on a renewables mandate and say, well, we're going to get 80% of our electricity from renewables in five years or in 10 years or whatever. And they can put that into place and um, they don't have to worry about the grid, they, they feel, because after all, ISO is running the grid, there's auctions, it's, everything's going to be great. But as a matter of fact, uh, renewables are, um, are very hard on the grid in, in a whole bunch of different ways. One of them, of course, is that they go on and off at their own schedule. And uh, one of the few uh, uh, projects to look at this said that you have to have 1.1 um, megabytes of installed fast acting backup for every megabyte, meg, I'm sorry, megawatt, 1.1 uh, megawatts of fast acting backup for every one megawatt of renewables you, you put in. And why you need this fast acting backup? Well, the thing is renewables, when they go offline, they can go offline pretty quickly. You know, the sun sets, the clouds go over. So you need something that can come up very fast. And so that is uh, why you hear a lot of people saying, we need a flexible grid. No, you don't need a flexible grid if you, if, if, if you don't have things that go on and off. I mean, 
you need some flexibility in a grid because as I say, the demand goes up during the day and then it comes down. But traditional power plants have always been able to track that pretty well. The, you need fast acting power plants to back up the renewables. And, that, uh, and, 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 and I find that very, um, uh, you know, it's not, it's not something I'm, I'm, I'm delighted about, but I'm, uh, because what it means is every time you build a renewable, you empower a fast acting gas plant to back it up. Because there's only two kinds of plants that can back it up right now. And that is a gas plant and a, a gas fire plant because they're internal combustion engines so they can start quickly. And, they, um, and, and the other kind is hydro. But of course, we don't have, you, if we keep building more and more renewables, we don't have enough hydro to back them all up. I mean, and, uh, you know, and, and it's not easy to build hydro. As a matter of fact, more hydro is being taken out than being built nowadays because people don't like it for, for, for a lot of good reasons. Well, we're talking wind and solar and, and uh, seem to be attractive alternatives, but I know your book uh, really uh, gets into this on, on a very fair basis. You, you talk about your background uh, and there's, there's a lot of quotable quotes here and I just want to read one. Renewables and batteries are overhyped and are, the, are beginning to be overbuilt. Both can be helpful to the grid. Even together, they cannot be the grid. Uh, so I yes, that's right. That's what it boils down to. They can be helpful and they can be, uh, you know, but they can't be the grid. I mean, uh, it, it, it's, yeah, like I say, you know, I didn't, um, I, 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 I like renewables in so many ways. I mean, for example, if, if you think about, um, if you think about a coal train or you think about a gas pipeline, you've got to move all that fuel from point A to point B, sometimes across the country. Uh, do you know that the power plant, uh, the Merrimack Station coal plant, which is a very nice little coal plant, I mean, not a fan of coal plants, but it's a very nice, very well-run one. Um, it gets uh, it gets coal on barges from Venezuela, among other places. I mean, you move in a lot of fuel for these fossil plants, and that's one of the wonderful things about renewables. But unfortunately, renewables go on and off so quickly that they bake in gas hot fired plants to back them up. They just bake it in. You say, oh, we're building so many renewables. Aren't we proud of ourselves? Well, if you don't want blackouts, you're building gas plants too. And, and, and people just don't know that. And uh, anyway, so, yeah. yeah. I like to say that all of these things, like the, the popularity of renewables, the, uh, the downside uh, in, in public opinion uh, about certain types of things and, and uh, all of this stuff, uh, you know, part of the entire picture, and you really explain it very succinctly, and you use some terminology that uh, I'm sure that uh, somehow, somewhere, it shows up in everybody's electric bill. And you know, it's great how you put it together. Um, I just want to uh, talk about one little word. It's a, it's again, it's a, one of those exciting words: greenwash. Tell us what that's. Oh, greenwash. Well, okay. In my opinion, there's a lot of it going on. <laughs> Greenwashing means that you do something which helps your company, but somehow or other you describe it as being done for the good of the people and the good of the environment. And, and, and how could anyone object to you guys doing this? And uh, let me give you uh, an, an example of, uh, of, of greenwashing. So you have some company and it says, um, we're so proud of ourselves. We run on 100% renewable electricity at this company. So you imagine this company surrounded by wind turbines. No, 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 no. They're getting their power from the grid just like anybody else. Their power is a mixture of uh, gas and oil or gas and coal and gas and renewables or gas and nuclear. Anyway. Well, why are they saying they have 100% renewable electricity? Well, what it turns out is that when a, a renewable plant like a, a, a wind turbine makes a kilowatt hour of electricity, it makes an invisible object, which is a renewable energy certificate 
for one kilowatt hour of, of renewable electricity. And it generally sells the electricity one direction and the certificate another direction. So that company which says, oh, we're 100% renewable electricity, you should love us, has just bought a bunch of wrecks. It's still getting, and, and from the company's point of view, it's a perfect situation. It's, it, 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 can, it can cover itself with honor and greenwashing. We are so green. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it has very reliable electricity. It doesn't have to worry about what the wind dies down. So uh, anyhow, I, I just, that is greenwashing. And it is, it is all over the place. I mean, I, 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 you know, once you begin seeing how it works, you think, oh, I can't believe it. They're doing it again. So at any rate. Well, there's, there's a, a great deal of really practical uh, advice in here and, and practical uh, information that anyone uh, who is a, what do they call it, rate payers or uh, consumers or uh, whatever, uh, who pays electric bills, uses electricity, uh, wants cheaper uh, power uh, or needs cheaper power for economic development. There's just a lot of good information in here. Uh, and I just want to, before we uh, conclude, I want to ask, where can people get this book? And more importantly, how can people get in touch with you? Do you have a website or, or things of that nature? Okay. My, my website is meredithangwin.com. And there are several places on the website. It has several pages, a page about books, a page for blogs, da, 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 a page about my biography. There's several of the pages have a sign-up sheet so that you can get my newsletter. So you, if you go to MeredithAngwin.com, you can sign up for my newsletter. And, um, and then uh, the, uh, uh, the book is available through Amazon, Shorting the Grid, uh, The Hidden Fragility of Our Electric Grid. It's available in three forms through Amazon. It's available as a softback, which is what I sent you. It's available as a hardback because somebody told me that, that no library or no school would buy the softback, so it's available as a hardback. I don't, I don't actually expect people to flock to buying it. And it's available as a Kindle. And as a Kindle, it's very, very affordable. Uh, I made that choice very deliberately uh, so that people could get it as a Kindle. If you uh, don't like Amazon, and some people don't, uh, and, and the, uh, you, can, you can buy the uh, ebook as a Nook, and you can also buy it as a Kobo, which is actually very popular outside of the United States. You can get a Nook or a Kobo. Um, Barnes and Noble Nook. Um, I also want to say that if you, it's not carried in the stores, but a Books a Million, Walmart, and your local uh, independent bookstore can all order the book from Ingram Spark. They all deal with Ingram Spark, and the book is available from Ingram Spark. So if you wanted to, if you walk into your local independent bookstore, assuming you could walk in, which isn't true nowadays, but you could at least uh, contact them and said, hey, can you get me a copy of this book? And they should be able to because all the bookstores deal with Ingram Spark. That's great. And I see it was just published on uh, November 6th, 2020. We're recording this on December 7th. And yes. that's the positivity Vermont deals with old stuff. Uh, this, is, uh, this is really good. I want to quote something. Uh, uh, that you, you say uh, here near the end, or actually right at the end, and I think it's very important. Um, and I'm quoting you, uh, if we are not concerned with the grid, we will not have a safe and happy country to leave our children. I can't say it any more starkly than that. We must take the grid away from the insiders, or our children may be outsiders in some very unpleasant ways. And that's the last paragraph of the book. And it is quite uh, shocking, again, to uh, pardon the electrical puns, but why don't you expand on that as, as we conclude today? Well, I'm expanding on that because I have, uh, I have grandchildren and um, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm distressed at the grid having these layers and layers of auctions and confusion and, and closed meetings. And um, I, I remember uh, one time I was in a meeting and, and someone was presenting and saying, well, we, we went to our stakeholders and I kind of raised my hand and said, I'm not a member of Neepool, but I'm one of your stakeholders because I buy, I buy electricity from you. And so at any rate, um, from the grid rather. So I, uh, 
you see, the thing is, there are places that are going to to roll in blackouts to to where the grid operator just shuts the power off for a while and then turns it back on again. And so the, the and uh, California has had them. We are in danger of having them. Uh, uh, the, the a projection of what will happen in. Uh, 2025, a couple of scenarios were done by our grid operator, 23 scenarios were done. 19 of the scenarios had rolling blackouts in the winter. Now the grid operator will say, we're not predicting, these are just scenarios, but I mean, it's like the overwhelming percentage of scenarios had rolling blackouts in the winter. And our, and in my opinion, that makes people outsiders in terms of their lives. They can't predict things anymore. They can't, they can't plan for, um, you know, what they're doing when, because they don't know if they'll have electricity then. Uh, and, and, and plus, which it endangers people a lot. For example, grid operator won't tell you when the rolling blackouts are going to happen because it would encourage uh, uh, the crim criminals to come into the area where the blackouts are. Uh, having electricity is a safety issue. It's a safety issue about, about people's lives, about people's warmth, about uh, sick people and their ability to get care. And it's a safety issue about keeping, you know, <laughs> keeping your house safe from, from, from people who might want to uh, rob you. So I guess the thing is, um, I, I, I just feel that I don't want the kind of rolling blackouts that may happen in here and are, are already happening in California. Uh, and, you know, they say, well, it's hot. Well, man, it gets hot in California all the time. They're not having rolling blackouts because it's unprecedentedly hot. We didn't, we wouldn't have rolling blackouts per, at a high percentage of the possibility five years from now, because people are expecting we'll have much colder winter five years from now. No, it's about how the grid is managed. We have to realize that. I'm sorry, I get very worked up about this subject. <laughs> that's, great. That, that's great because, uh, you know, it, it, it might not sound like an exciting uh, topic, but again, your book really uh, brings it into perspective and also brings a lot of the urgency uh, to it. Uh, and uh, so it's more than just a good read, I think. And, uh, but I want to thank you. Uh, uh, this is uh, Dennis McMahon uh, for Positively Vermont. My guest today has been Meredith Angwin, uh, the author of a recently, uh, very newly published book about your electrical uh, system, uh, Shorting the Grid, The Hidden Fragility of Our Electric Grid, uh, a very interesting work uh, by uh, this uh, Vermonter. So uh, thank you very much for being thank here, you. Meredith. And Thank you all for watching Positively Vermont. This is Dennis McMahon.